without uh, dealing in further with uh, in mind the next uh, speaker, that is uh, Professor Abdullah Bistumadu Bala, uh, to talk on uh, research capacity and infrastructure development as a part of uh, nation building. Now, Professor Bistumadu Bala is the director of the Institute, of, uh, Institute for Research and Development, and he is a visiting senior lecturer of the Department of Health Service and Population Research in College London. He is also the travelling professor of the Royal Australian and New Zealand uh, College of Psychiatrists. Uh, he has been validated by UNESCO as an expert in uh, bioethics. He is a member of the uh, WHO working group on somatic distress and dissociative disorder. He is also a member of the, the scientific committee of the International Network of Pin Register. His research interests are medically unexplained symptoms, pin research, and pin, pin research methods and ethics. So he will talk uh, about that so much Thank you, sir. Thanks for that kind introduction. First of all, I would like to thank everybody who um, was behind this invitation. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here to share some of my thoughts and experience. When they wanted the title, I suggested that I would speak about research capacity and infrastructure development as part of nation building. But later I thought I'll change it by extending this to the nation building in, in post-war Sri Lanka in the context of scientific imperialism. I'm not trying to politicize this, it's not my um, emphasis, but it's based on an editorial by the BMJ because this is the sad reality. Outline of my talk, I will first talk a little bit about the background and the philosophy of what I have just said. Then I'll share some of my work and personal experience highlighting the challenges, hurdles and achievements. And then I'll share with you my thoughts based on my experience about the essential ingredients for successful capacity building and research infrastructure development. And also um, share some of my thoughts about the way forwards. I don't have to tell you this, you know, we have so much of strengths in Sri Lanka. Health indices are comparable with the West. An excellent public health infrastructure and record. We had tsunami, but we didn't have any communicable disease outbreaks. We have traditional biomedicine, very much established in Sri Lanka. There's archaeological evidence of hospitals dating back to the 19th century. Colombo Medical School was founded in 1870. I'm proud to be a student of that. Then Ceylon Medical Journal, Professor Jamila Silla, who was the editor, who I am here today, is one of the oldest uh, journals in, in Australasia. And we also have a long-standing scientific history. However, iron ironically, Sri Lanka is known both many uh, worldwide for all reasons, uh, partly about the internal conflict we dragged for many, many years, and also the highest suicidal rate we, we had, and also highest high mental health mobility. I have to tell you right now, our mental health is one of the most neglected non-communicable diseases which is not highlighted adequately, uh, ironically. And the basis of my presentation is based on these two books, one of the chapters I wrote on research infrastructure, although it's based for mental health. I mean, you can generalize it to any research infrastructure development and also the other Oxford publication addressing the ethical issues in global mental health. Uh, it's not necessarily about the trials, it's about the ethics. I heard in the morning plenary session somebody was talking about the direction of research and the values. That's the values we talk about. I have actually brought two copies which I would donate to the library. So I don't I will not attempt to go into the depth of the subject, but I will try and cover the breadth, which is very important. And as I have said here, there wouldn't be any development without health, and there wouldn't be any health with, without mental health. And the sad reality is that despite spectacular progress in science and technology during the 20th century, as we enter the 21st, the world is more inequitable than it was 50 years ago. Disparities in wealth and health within and between nations are widening and the rapidly expanding global economy has failed to reduce poverty and improve health for all. 
This is evident in both in terms of access to health care for individuals and in relation to the health of whole populations. Billions of people live in degrading poverty with little if any access to health care and the universal declaration of human rights remains an unrealized aspiration for majority of the world's people. It includes the New Orleans citizens who is living in the most powerful country in the world, U.S. And again, ironically, 80% of annual global expenditure on health is spent on 16% of world population that bears only 7% of the burden. I deliberately cited an old reference because things have not progressed since then. Although more than 90% of world's potential years of life lost belong to the developing world, an estimated 10% of global research funds are devoted to studying the developing world health problem. Now, this is what I meant by the scientific empirism and the 90 can divide. It doesn't stop there. We analyze three years of publications in psychiatry leading international journals to find only 6% of research come from 90% disease burden countries. So we thought maybe this is because mental health, which is not a popular thing. Then we, sorry, then we went and analyze the leading five journals in medicine, BMJ, Lancet, JAMA, to find only 6.5% of research come from 90% disease burden countries. So, to add to that, again this is not my wording, the moral bankruptcy of pharma industry, the UK top boss, leading scientist, was talking about the recent Ebola outbreak. And his words are the pharmaceutical industry are reluctant to invest in research to produce treatments and vaccines because the numbers involved are in their terms so small and don't justify the investment. And we shouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is a bit outdated, but I couldn't find the latest. But again, during these two years, out of 1,230 new drugs, only 13 were for tropical diseases. So this is the world we live in. This is what we call 1090 gap. So, in this context of bitter reality, where do we stand? As a country, we always say we, we are proud, we have got a very high literacy rate in the region. But what we do really do? We are distributing existing knowledge generated elsewhere. I sh showed you only 10% research which has come from this is 90% disease burden country. So whose evidence are we practicing and whose evidence are we distributing? In terms of measurable research output, I am sad to say, we are just marginally above Nepal. This is again not my analysis, this is the science citation, world science, the latest. So this is not very satisfactory situation. On one hand, we have so much of strength as a nation, but on the other hand, there is huge contradiction. So it's very timely, we are talking about generation of new knowledge, innovation and research. To me, innovation is what James Watt did. He was observing the kettle lid going up because of the steam, and that thought transformed into the product, which was the steam engine, which revolutionized our transport. However, my emphasis is not going to be about innovation, I'm going to talk to you about research. But can we actually swim against the tide, the tide against this 1090 gap? No funding is dominated by the Western nations, the journals are dominated by the publication from elsewhere, due to many different reasons. Yes, we can. I'm going to cite you three landmark studies from low and middle income countries. When I was a student, I was taught that eclampsia should be treated with little cocktail. That is based on small trials done in the West. But then this particular trial, which was done in South America, Africa and India, using uh, magnesium sulfate against lytic cocktail showed because of the numbers, the power of the study that the lytic cocktail was not the drug of touch magnesium sulfate that now it's universally accepted. So that's one of the examples. The second example, one of my closest colleagues with Ibom Burr, who is a psychiatrist, did this study, but before that the WHO for uh, vaginal discharge had a, um, a treatment, uh, a syndromic management treating them for all sexually transmitted diseases, which had a huge social cost. Because when the wife is treated for STD, the husband would suspect yeah, vice versa. Then what he did, a simple thing, he did some molecular bio uh, diagnostic studies and proved that it's nothing to do with the sexual transmitted disease. In fact, it is 
it is a, a, a you know, psychosocial.